Good afternoon. I'm Ed Pozzuoli, CEO of Trip Scott, and with, with me today is our longtime friend, Brian Kilmeade from Fox & Friends. Brian, welcome. Thanks for having me, Ed. Appreciate and it. And now this is the second book, uh, Teddy and Booker T. I'll show this to everybody. It's uh, timely in its topic. Right. And uh, something we could actually learn from history. Imagine that. You love education, too, this and is this great. is all about it. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, right on the money, right? Yeah. So, Talk about how did you come to this project? I mean, Teddy Roosevelt and Booker T. Washington, totally different backgrounds, right. totally different American stories, uniquely well, American. Well, people always say that education is a great equalizer. Yeah. And everyone talks about that uh, rhetorically, but they actually lived it. And rather than looking around and saying, well, this is, it's bad the way blacks are treated compared to whites, absolutely. Uh, slavery, horrible, horrendous. We didn't invent it, but we didn't stop it. Understood. So when you, when you win the Civil War, when the North wins the Civil War, it's time to equalize things. Well, how do you equalize people that have not had any education? In fact, if you got caught teaching a black person in the South anything of to read, write, or any fundamentals of education, you could go to jail. Uh, so that was punishable by uh, imprisonment. So, you know, with Frederick Douglass, he manipulated one of the slave owners' uh, wives to do that. She was like kind of new to the South, and she was able to do it with Booker T. Washington. He just didn't learn anything until he was nine, never had any shoes, slept on the floor. And then he just had was born with this thirst for education. So when I saw that the book, what he meant for education, how he started, and how he ends up pioneering his way in the South, in Alabama, through a university, forging his way at Hampton College, learning the fundamentals, and then seeing himself rise through education, I thought that's the perfect theme for what's going on today. If you have a problem, you could either protest and sit in as a place for that, or you can go out there and change people's perception by, by pure achievement. And he can't get achievement without education. And he realized that early. And the more he learned, the more he wanted to learn. Uh, he learned to speak. He had mentors along the way. He learned to lose his accent, learned the fundamentals of things that we take for granted, like hygiene, uh, learned how to take care of a house, all fundamentals of people in that transition period in 1870 when blacks went from enslaved to citizens. Right. And to excel, he said, not only do you need to learn to read, write, and round out in, in fundamentals, but you also need to learn a trade. So that's something that we're also learning too, because they looked around when slavery, and this is what Ron DeSantis was trying to say, when, when slaves were freed, they had skills. Doesn't mean slavery was good. Right. People misinterpreted but that. But they did have but they skills. They had skills, and guess who didn't? The white people. So something goes wrong with the house. You had to fix anything with the crops. You had to uh, have a problem with uh, the wagons or any type of um, agricultural technology. The, the, the ones that were doing it were the slaves. So they left with a set of skills, no education. The other guys had education, they had no skills. So he said, now that you are learn gonna learn to read and write, you're not gonna stop being good with your hands. So Mike Rowe is on the back of the book for that reason because he wanted to teach the That's need to learn a trade right. along with education. I found uh, very uh, current the story about how Booker T came to his last name in light of us wanting to tear down st statues right. and, and historical figures, whether it's uh, Columbus or whether it's you know Andrew Jackson or whomever. But I found it instructive. Talk about that. In about a minute. He had to come up with the last name now that he was in school, and he came up with Washington. And if you look at the mom's, he never knew his father, but when his mom started dating, his guy's name was uh, Washington Ferguson. If you see that the most popular name from uh, slaves as they found freedom was Washington, because he was their founding father too. Right. And Jefferson, same thing. So you saw that over and over again, which is amazing. No one judged them. They said, oh, of course, why wouldn't you want to be Washington? So who owned slaves? But in so, the context of the day. Yeah, in the context of the day. Right. You own slaves, but that was the most popular name. And that's just, I mean, in light of what's going on today, when you look back and try to put today's mores against what yeah. happened 250 years ago, it's well, difficult. In New York City right now, they're voting on whether to take the statues of Washington down, which is the site of the first presidential right. house, the right. White House. And where, uh, this, where Washington said goodbye to his troops after winning the Civil War, in 1783, he said goodbye, he walks down, and he takes hops on a barge, and he leaves. And, well, let's take a statue down. Well, we had slaves. And to me, I find it unbelievably ridiculous uh, that people would even consider that, and it shows a, a lack of understanding of what history is. 
So if you're going to judge history instead of studying history, congratulations, uh, the people of uh, the, 20, uh, the 2020s. Uh, you're arrogant enough to think we know everything, and they're not going to come back and look at what we're doing now in 2024 and think we've got to take any type of remembrance of any type of uh, uh, figure down to. We'll be a nation of pedestals. But don't eliminate the history. You learn from the history. Yeah. You, you understand the history. You put it in its appropriate context. But you also learn from the history. There's some pieces of history we may not be proud of, but we shouldn't never forget it either. I'm pretty sure that was a given. I can't believe we have to go revisit I it. I can't believe that either. Right. And the other thing that I think you'd appreciate too with Teddy Roosevelt is that he was so sick he couldn't go to school. He had asthma. He had a cholera of the intestines. He, they could not get him out of their sight, so all he would do is basically be homeschooled. So talk about Teddy Roosevelt. What was the interest that Teddy Roosevelt, why did he take the interest in Booker T? I think self-made man. He loved people that forged their own way. He loved people that didn't make excuses. He loved people that wanted to make a difference, which is pretty amazing when you consider his mom was from the South, whose two brothers and his uncles fought for the Civil, Confederacy. Right, right. And you know, you must imagine, he worshipped his parents. You talk about that a little bit in the book, too, yeah. in the background. Yeah, he, he worshipped his parents, and, and you imagine what those dinner conversations were like. The father felt different than the mother, and the one acquiescence he gave was, um, you could support the Union, but don't fight against my family. So that was one would thing Teddy Roosevelt said. He saw how his dad was tortured by the fact that he didn't fight in the Civil War. And that's why he was so determined to fight in the Spanish War. As soon as that popped up, he wanted to get in there. He says that's the one thing he wanted to uh, rectify about his father's legacy. One of the things I found interesting, too, in, in, particularly in today's context, is both, obviously, Teddy Roosevelt and Booker T were proud to be Americans. No question. And they wanted to make the country better. And that's what bothered a lot of people like W.B. Du Bois. He goes, why are you so accommodating? They treat blacks like second they have citizens. There's a there's, uh, Jim Crow was real. The, right. the, hang, the lynchings were real. The poll taxes, if you're going to vote, you're going to get shot or you're going to be threatened or your house is going to burn down if you show up at the ballot box and uh, you'll, you'll have a competency test, a literacy test. All these negative things, obviously, that showed a bias and a racist. So he's like, okay, how do I deal with this? How do I make it better? Which pra what's pragmatic? A pragmatic approach to making it better in the era in which I lived rather than saying there's no way this is right. W.E.B. Du Bois, who's more Malcolm X, Al, Al Sharpton, was like, no, I'm, I have a PhD. I know what's wrong. I've traveled around. They're not doing this. Make a stand. He's like, well, I am making a stand. I'm graduating 1,200 at a time. I'm making right. speeches around the country. I'm pointing out to people the biases, the activity. I'm getting the most powerful people in the country, Andrew Carnegie, uh, J.P. Morgan, uh, Julius Rosenwald. I'm getting the founder of Sears. I'm getting the most powerful people in the country to put their money and backing behind it to change beliefs in a generation. And little by little, people learn, wait a second. I thought blacks weren't as smart as whites. This guy now owns his own farm. This guy is now hiring other people to work on that farm. Uh, I thought they were insulin and they were always going to be robbing. What? They're making, uh, they're making bricks. They're giving them to the town. They, uh, they are builders. Their campus is pristine. Right. Uh, they welcome world leaders from around the world. So maybe my parents and my grandparents were absolutely wrong. That's, that's Booker T. Washington. He was lauded around the world. Now, in fact, I didn't know this, but we went to Tuskegee. One of the professors says that we learned in the Booker T. Washington Julius Rosenwald schools uh, in Africa. And he said, we all looked up to Booker T. Washington. And it's been a goal of mine to get to Tuskegee to visit. And I got a job offer, and he's here. And he says, we worship Booker T. Washington, but in this country right now, we don't. And I know think people get hot and cold in history, too. Like people have told me, if you were to put money on a historical figure, Ulysses S. Grant, the more people study him, what a fine person right. he was. He was mislabeled Far as more a drunk. Depth, right, he, right. He Far more in depth than before. Absolutely. Right. He wasn't corrupt. Some people he hired and trusted were corrupt. But he steadied the ship for eight years after that lunatic Andrew Johnson took over, right. and he, who wanted to undo everything they gained through, uh, the, through the deaths of 600,000 Americans plus. So he was there. But it also makes you wonder what good they could have done if Frederick Douglass combined with Lincoln, combined with Grant, how much different a country would have been. In my humble opinion, I said we wouldn't have needed the 1960s if, if Lincoln had survived the 1860s. 1860s would have been. And I just think it would have been totally different. He could have served three or four terms. Guy was 50 years old. And there was no limit back then, and had he survived, why can you imagine him in peacetime? It would be unbelievable. But clearly a second term, a full second term for Lincoln, and then Grant following would have been a... Bring us right to the next century. Right. And Grant regretted kind of not staying on for the next term because it ends up being 
the Compromise of 1877, which was disastrous for the country when Rutherford B. Hayes uh, was uh, locked in a battle with Samuel Tilden, Rutherford B. Hayes, the Republican, and we were just rebuilding the country, and about five to seven states were an absolute electoral mess. We could not figure out who won, and there was corruption everywhere. So in a deadlock, the inauguration staring us straight ahead in March, they go, let's do a deal. They go, okay, I'll give you a Republican president, but you pull all your Union troops out of the South and let us govern. They go, yeah, I'll do that, but don't go backwards. They went backwards. They went backwards. But, but, but look, Booker T and Roosevelt knew what they were dealing with because of the reaction even when uh, Roosevelt invited Booker T to the White House. That was what everyone points to. That's what everybody points and to. And I have a special on Fox Nation that talks about, you know, John McCain referencing it in 2008 when he lost to Barack Obama. He says it was his time in this country when a black man eating at the White House was controversial. And now we have a man who's going to be hosting that party, which is pretty magnanimous for a guy that just lost an election and watched his dream of becoming president crash forever, which is we have to learn to lose in this country. He knows how to lose. I think we all should learn that. Um, I have a lot of experience. So, uh, but I just think that I just love the Booker T. Washington approach. He never says it was right, but what's possible? Well, you know, what is the compromise? What's possible? I got to move this country incrementally. When they, when the Southern newspapers had a meltdown, and magazines had a meltdown, and politicians had a meltdown. When he went to visit, they thought these blacks are going to come up, and they're going to think they are equal to us. We don't want that. In the North, for the most part, they had no problem with it. In the South, uh, they had a collective aneurysm. So he said, "Okay, we got to change our relationship. It's got to keep a little bit more profile. Let's not provoke." because his goal was to make sure Tuskegee survived. So from an education standpoint of our children, tell me why, uh, why this is an important book to read. Um, number one, overcoming all types of obstacles. Don't tell me the obstacles are too deep. Don't tell me your parents On both are too sides. terrible. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. So when, when you're born a slave and you don't have any shoes, don't know your father, you don't know your birthday. Right. There's a lot of people you could be blaming. Yeah, and instead you're in the salt mines and you're claustrophobic and you're 10 years old and all you want to do is get an education and you're dying for this education, and he just had to find a way, and then he finds out this Miss Ruffner is looking for someone to take care of their house, and she's somebody who's very demanding, and all his people that he knew, the kids he knew, couldn't handle it. He's like, I need to get out of the salt mines, I'm gonna handle it. And because he was so determined to be successful and such a sponge to learn, he ends up excelling. And I would say the other thing is with Teddy Roosevelt. People think because you have money, you have everything, because you have a big name, you know, you, your path is, is paved, and he said, absolutely not. Because if you don't have your health, he you didn't have his health, right? And he was mocked. He was a little guy. He weighed about 80 pounds in a, what we would consider 11th grade, like in high school. And when he went out, he got bullied all the time. So we ended up overcompensating. Dad said, "Build up your body." When he saw how serious he was, he bought him weights, and then he just started working out. And he decided there was nothing he couldn't do. He'd sleep on the ground with the toughest rangers in the middle of uh, of a territory called we call now North Dakota. Right. And he would go out and be a cop and work the streets in inner city New York, the most rugged place around with illegal immigrants everywhere. He would go down there and tell his cops, you're going to start listening to me. So he understood the blue collar work ethic. He understood what it was like to not be promised tomorrow in life. And he liked the country. He liked the possibility. And guess what? He was mocked. People thought he was, in the, uh, thought he was a knucklehead. They thought he was just all, Mark, including Mark Twain. Mark Twain was like, I don't like this guy. He's all show. You know, he talks too much. He's always boasting. He's always proclaiming. He's already, he's always dreaming. So certain people in this world aren't going to like you. But what's his image? They both died at 59 and 60. And look at the impact they made. Right. And their relationship was strong. Absolutely. Mutual respect. And I think they both knew their objectives. Like he had to get reelected. He had to be politically strong. At the same time, their loyalty was rich. How could I help you? Why don't you go on the board of Tuskegee? I'm in. Why don't you speak at the commencement? Commencement. I'm in. He spoke to. He was uh, all new. He knew he was going to speak at his eulogy. He wrote the forward to Teddy Roosevelt to one of Booker T. Washington's last books. But at the same time, uh, Booker T. Washington was loyal to him, to delivering the black vote, letting him know what the people of the South wanted. He said at one quote, "Is I want you to recommend to me judges and portmasters and postmasters, but I don't want you to uh, give me the person because of their gender." Or their, uh, or their ethnicity. He goes, just give me the best person. Because I gotta, if I have to defend them, give me the best person. And he was defending blacks and whites and whatever because he knew the people. He trusted Booker T. Washington's judgment of people. 
I found that the the relationship between Booker, <coughs> uh, Booker T. Washington and Teddy Roosevelt was uh, an expression of how great America could be. Yeah. Yeah, overcoming, understanding, and trying to make the country better, but also doing what's possible. You know, you don't sit there in judgment. I think like today, in today's day and age, you have these people on the streets who think this country isn't good enough for them, and they haven't accomplished a thing in their life. All they do is protest things that they looked at as injustices, and it's embarrassing. So if you are a standout in this next generation, if you understand the concepts in this book, you're going to have an easier path to massive success because the rest of these, a lot of this generation, not all, uh, are in, in for a rude awakening. And so I want to leave you, and one, I want to thank you, my friend, for joining us. And two, this is a fantastic book, a great education for all ages. It puts a lot of context to this relationship, and it has, how would I say, legs in, in how it applies to today's uh, issues that we grapple with and people's approaches on those issues. So uh, Teddy and Booker T., Brian, thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it.